Hey, 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 what's going on, Cloud Scholars? I hope everyone out there is having a blessed day. My name is Kieran Tross, and I'm going to thank you for clicking on this video. If you are watching this video, it's because you are looking into Azure naming conventions, and this is exactly what I want to talk to you about today. Now, many of you know I work as a cloud architect, and I deal with clients all the time. And one of the things that constantly gets brought up is naming conventions and how they go about doing naming conventions within the cloud. So one of the things I want to talk about is why are naming conventions important? So Azure resource names must be unique in your environment. Teams need to be able to view and find resources without asking questions. Resources should be clear on their purpose by what the name states. It removes ambiguity. I remember encountering a client and they had uh, resource group names that were, you know, didn't make sense. They had virtual machines that didn't make sense. Uh, when you look at your Azure resource, you should say, okay, I understand exactly what this resource is for. I understand if it's for dev. I understand if it's for test, et cetera, et cetera. That exactly how your naming convention should really be uh, displayed for you. If you have naming conventions where it's hard to understand by looking at what the uh, information shows, then your naming conventions aren't good. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. You really want to have your naming conventions where anyone who comes and gets onboarded is able to figure out what that specific resource is responsible for doing. So let's talk a little bit about how we got here within the cloud environment. So naming conventions isn't something that just came about when we moved to the cloud or when, you know, Azure, AWS, and GCP came about. Naming conventions is something that you've been doing in IT for a very long time. On-premise, it's a little bit easier to capture. You do have some restrictions on-premise because of how Active Directory onboards names, let's just PC names, and you have a limit to that NetBIOS information. So if you see on the screen, uh, if this was a on-premise uh, setup, we would have address 15 Grove Street, and the name would probably be something like Grove PC1. Address 83 Belvoir Avenue, and this isn't made up information, so just don't take it anyway. If I hope I didn't write somebody else's address here, but uh, please forgive me. Uh, but the name would be Belvoir PC1. But then if you had another one, which would be headquarters, you'd probably call HQ PC1. So what happens is if there is an issue with a desktop or something's coming up um, and you're like, hey, you know, what's going on with this machine? You know, that's happened before where I was working uh, for a healthcare company. We had a ton of remote sites. And if, you know, something was coming up under the knock, like there was some kind of a security alert, uh, PC was out of compliance for whatever reason, we'd say, okay, what's going on with this PC? And we would see the name come up. So we would be like, okay, we understand exactly, you know, where this PC is located. Now, hopefully you know exactly all your subnets within your organization so that this way you should be able to identify an address by the subnet. But, you know, we're not in the perfect world. You do have your PCs, which will probably will provide you some information about where it is. And depending if the site is a huge site, you can never know, it could be like 15 stories and there's tons of PCs there. You may have a naming convention that will help you identify what floor that uh, PC or laptop is located at. So, you know, those are the reasons why naming conventions are important because they help you identify what's going on. So that this way, if you have to pull a resource, you're able to go to it and grab it. But this is on-prem. We're talking about Azure now. So where do you start in Azure uh, to properly obtain and do the right things for your naming convention? So first we need to start with understanding the scope levels. So there's global, there's Azure subscription, there's resource group, and there's resource attribute. So let's go through each one. Global, this scope requires Azure resources to have unique names across all of Azure. This can be this can only be used by one Azure customer, for example, an app service or a storage account. So when you go to create a storage account, when you're just going about creating it, if you remember, sometimes you'll be typing in a name and then it would say, this name is already taken. And then you have to add some digits to it, like a two, three, four, or some type of numbering system there. 
that is global. Those are public facing resources. Uh, so that is the reason why those type of resources, and you know, when you're doing your naming conventions, you may run into some issues because you're setting up web apps or you're setting up app service or you're setting up storage accounts, which with those type of resources, they are global. So you're going to have a little bit more difficulty setting that up, but it can be completed. Now let's talk about Azure subscription. Each Azure resource group in a subscription must be unique within a subscription. So your resource groups in your Azure subscription have to be unique because that is how the subscription is reading it. You can't have two subscriptions with the same name. And then you have your resource group unique within the resource group. Example, all virtual networks in a resource group must have a unique name for routing within that resource group. So now we're at the resource group level we're scoping and it's talking about the uh, different resources within that resource group. So you can't have duplicates because of, and you look at what it's talking about, all virtual networks and a resource group must have a unique name for routing within that resource group. Then you have resource attributes unique within that parent resource. Example, all subnets within a virtual network must have a unique name to avoid segment overlap. So you can't have two subnets with the same name. So this is really what it comes down to understanding that scope. So first understand your limitations so that this way now you can now say, okay, now we've created something, a, re, a naming convention that will be approved and we won't run into any hiccups within the Azure. Okay, so let's think of some example resource names. So right here we have a public IP address. So this is, uh, and this, this screenshots from uh, Microsoft's uh, documentation. I'm going to leave that in the description as well uh, for this video. So it's PIP SharePoint Prod West US 001. So we start off with the resource type, then we have the workload application, then we have the environment, and then the Azure region and the instance. So this is some of the naming components in the description. So on the Microsoft site, this is a screenshot really quickly that I put together. And it just talks about the different components of your naming convention. So you have resource type, you'd have the business unit, you'd have the application or service name, the subscription purpose, prod shared client, and then we have an environment and then we have region. So that's exactly what you saw in the previous slide um, minus the whole instance right there. So this is the thing when it comes to, to these naming conventions, you can do a mix and match. You don't have to do it this way. Some things you can omit. So some people will say, you know what, with naming conventions, you know, uh, you want to make sure your naming convention, you don't want it too long. You know, um, that's one of the things that people try to, you know, remove themselves from doing. And then also you have the limitations with the, that global resources. So storage accounts, you'll have certain limitations, you know, with storage accounts that you have to think of when you're doing your naming convention. Sometimes people don't like to put the resource type in their naming conventions. That is entirely up to you. I'm not fully against resource types being in the naming convention. I think that it's actually a good thing, uh, but I can see why somebody will say, hey, I'm not going to put resource types in there. But it's really as, uh, important that you would have, you know, your business unit. Now, some companies might be a little different. You may not have to worry about the business units in the same way. Uh, but your application or service, you should definitely have that in there because you need to understand the purpose of it. Then the subscription, you should have that as well. I really believe because you'll have multiple subscriptions and you need to say, okay, what is this specific resource for? What subscription? And then environment is a must, you know? So if you're setting your, your, your naming conventions, you should definitely have something in there for prod, dev, you know, stage, test, et cetera, et cetera. Here is another example of a name convention. So this one has a resource type, has the business unit marketing, has a service name, SharePoint. It has a subscription, the shared services probably, subscription, has environment, prod, and then has West US for the region. So this is some quick environment abbreviation. So this is de development is dev, uh, test, do TST, uh, user accepting testing is UAT and then production. So instead of doing four letters, you try to do three letters. You're trying to make it as small as possible, but making sure that your team understands these abbreviations is key to making sure that you're successful. So here's another um, setup, right? Where you have the virtual machine, region, organization, environment, workload, instance type, and then um, for the, uh, and then type after instance, and then type 
for this naming convention. So this is a bunch of different naming conventions that I'm providing you because I want you to see different ways that people go about their naming conventions. But if you could look at this naming convention, everything is tied and related to the virtual machine. And this is a really nice naming convention here. So we have W2, which is West, West US2. Then you have CLS, right, the organization. Then you have the environment, UAT. Then you have GM305VM, which is the workload. And then you have O3, which is the instance. And then you have the, um, uh, the type is this resource group. And then if you go down further down, you see it's for a virtual machine and they all fall in line and you have the public IP address. Then you also have the virtual network. You have the network interface card and the OS disk. So this ver this naming convention is pretty clean because now you have everything related to it. So you can pull this up easily. You just type in the first couple um, areas up to workload and then you'll get everything that's related to that virtual machine. So this is a very nice naming convention here that you can use so that this way you can set that up for the rest of your organization. So how do you go about setting up and enforcing uh, naming conventions? Well, you'd use Azure policies. So if you look on the screen right now, what we have is the Azure policy and I have a cut off um, because I got this, I just did a screenshot from a Microsoft documentation and I'm gonna leave a link in the, in the video description so that this way you all can see it. But you're gonna do a custom Azure policy to make sure that if the name that gets created, that gets um, set up for that virtual machine uh, does not match, then what happens is the effect, and that's at the bottom there, is deny. So if you look through this, it says if all of field name not match and they have a concatenation there, VM, and then you will have your different parameters that you want to set up to make sure that it falls in line with the right naming convention. So that this way, when your staff, your architects are deploying different resources, they don't deploy something that you don't want in your environment. One of the things about the names within Azure, once you set something up, if you need to change the name, you can't do that. You have to now delete that specific resource and you have to redeploy it with the correct name. Now, if that resource is being used in production, guess what? What are you gonna wait till nighttime to set that up and set another one up? You know, that takes a lot of time. So you wanna make sure that you don't run into those kind of situations and using Azure policies is definitely the way to go. All right, so that is a wrap for this video. Thank you all for watching. I hope the information I provide you was beneficial. If you haven't done so already, please smash that like and subscribe button. Here at Cloud Scholars, my goal is to get you from scholar to consultant and of course, consultant to expert. Thank you and see you next time.